Welcome to Stephanie, welcome to everybody. I'm Tamara Savage, Managing Director and Director of Public Programs, and it's my great pleasure to welcome mm. Stephanie in Chico, California, uh, as our guest speaker tonight. Before I turn over to Sandy, who's going to introduce um, Stephanie, I just want to tell everybody that we will have time at the end to do a brief Q&A. Um, to participate, please submit your questions through the Q&A box uh, below. And um, we will open the questions for, we will open the box for questions towards the end of Stephanie's talk. And uh, we'll try to get as, uh, to as many of them as possible. Uh, anyway, that's all from me. I'm going to hand over to Sandy, who is a longtime docent at the museum, a former board member and a second gen. Sandy, over to you. Thanks very much, Tamara. As a young child, Stephanie Seltzer survived the war in Poland hiding in different, completely different situations. Um, after the war, she was reunited with her mother and she lived in Vienna for six years before coming to the United States. In 1985, following a meeting of the American gathering of Holocaust survivors on which she served, Stephanie gathered a group of child survivors. And within a couple of years, they had formed what became known as the World Federation of Jewish Child Survivors and more recently, their descendants. There are now more than 60 such groups all over the world. The World Federation of Jewish Child Survivors of the Holocaust and Descendants has held 32 annual conferences in various cities and countries, each bringing together several hundred people. These conferences feature keynote speakers, panelists, and most importantly, workshops on topics of particular interest to those who survived as children and youth, as well as workshops for spouses and significant others, and separate workshops for second and now third generation. The workshops are of an emotional nature led by mental health professionals who are themselves Holocaust survivors or second generation. Stephanie is president um, of this organization. I'm a proud member of the board, and she is also a member of the Claims Conference. By the way, five years ago, Houston hosted one of these conferences and about five years before that, another. So Stephanie is, as I said, also a member of the Claims Conference and as you may or may not be aware, has been conducting a campaign uh, to persuade Mark Zuckerberg to take down uh, Holocaust denial pages which has been done, by the way, in Austria and in Germany, in countries where denial of the Holocaust is against the law. We're really honored to have Stephanie speak with us today. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I don't need to tell you, I'm sure that Sandy has been with us for quite some time and doing a super fantastic job. So thank you, Sandy. And I know it's not easy, especially in these times. Here we are in all different parts of the country, but we're able to be together in a way, and we mustn't forget that we're together. And um, so you've covered a little bit about how the organization came to be. So I think I will speak, and our time has been shortened, so I have to abbreviate a little bit. I will speak about how, um, my history as a child survivor. And I should tell you, since we survivors, we don't hold back stating our age, you know. I was born in 1938. Yes, I can't believe it myself that I'm that year, that old right now. Um, but um, again, I, I will just give it to you very briefly. And I will say I got started talking about this in, well, I actually was speaking to as to schools in the early 70s, long before many other survivors spoke. And it happened, how did it happen that I started speaking so early? The way it happened is that my husband was friendly with a man who was a member of a rotary in Pennsylvania. And one day this man asked me, not a Jewish man, would I be willing to speak to a rotary on a particular morning? And in a foolish moment, I said, okay. And then I stood in front of all these men in the seventies, 
just all men, mostly doctors and dentists. And I thought to myself, what can I possibly say to these people that they can relate to about my experience? But I had no choice. I was supposed to speak 20 minutes. So I spoke. They said, don't stop, don't stop. I continued another 20 minutes. Don't stop, don't stop. And when I finally did stop, there was a reception line and two men walked up that were crying. And one of them, it turns out, was the liberator of a concentration camp. And one was a minister whose daughter was doing volunteer work on the kibbutz. And I said to myself, underneath we're all just human. And after that, I was booked speaking at Rotary's morning, noon, and night, and the women's groups, and finally schools. Every kind of schools, particularly Catholic schools, were very receptive to hearing me speak. And this continued. And um, many questions came up that I hadn't even given any thought to, but the people to whom I spoke, students and adults, asked me many questions. And um, I might say that one of the things that came up was that some years ago, after I had been doing extensive speaking, Hadassah magazine, I don't recall what year it was, but it was quite a few years ago, did a feature story about me. And it gave my old email address. And about a week and a half later, I got an email from someone who said, what was your maiden name? Because I also was in that ghetto during the war. And I cited my, my maiden name, Fishman, and the email came back. I knew your whole family and I knew you as a toddler in the ghetto and gave me her phone number. It turns out the woman was Helen Fagan. Some of you may know the name. She was one of the people who worked with Elie Wiesel to get the Holocaust Memorial Museum built. 103 now. And she has a memory unlike any that I've ever seen with anyone, unbelievable. And she was able to connect me with a relative actually in Australia because she knew the names. Anyway, so I did resume speaking, you know, with groups all over with, I spoke at schools, as I said, I spoke at colleges and such. So I'll give you just a brief experience of my experience as a survivor. So I was just a little past three um, when I was smuggled out of the ghetto. People asked me, do I remember, as, as this woman asked me, she asked me about the apartment in the ghetto where I had been. And she said, shall we? I said, yes, I remember it very well. She said, shall we do a walkthrough? And I said, yes, and I can see it. I described to her exactly where everyone was. We had moved into the Radomsko ghetto where my paternal grandparents were because they had, my family had a very large glass factory in Poland. They manufactured cheap quality glass but brought in porcelain and such from Germany to sell in a retail store which was in Radomsko. And I don't, I know, I was born in Lodz but I don't know at what age we had come to the Radomsko ghetto to be with the grandparents, as had my father's uh, sister and, you know, her family and, and a brother with his family. So anyway, I have very clear memories of the things with the, my grandparents, etc. I won't tell you much about that. But anyway, um, so the other memory was that... Uh, I, I, as I said, I was smuggled out of the ghetto. And just prior to being smuggled out of the ghetto, my mother was getting things ready for me to take with me. And so in those days, you know, she wanted me to have a doll to go with me. And in those days, the doll's bodies were made of cloth and stuffed with sawdust. So they had the head of the doll, which was like a porcelain. Today would be plastic. And they made this, they bought this, doll's body and my cousin Bronca who was 12 years older than I who by the way is the only one of the children who had been in their ghetto with me who also survived but not with me and um, she took me by the hand with this doll to be taken to the store that my grandparents had and to for the doll's body to be stuffed with sawdust and I remember some Gestapo officers in like a Jeep 
were behind us and they tried to run us down and every time they we run up the stairs and they didn't get us they would lean back and laugh and finally when we got to the store we ran up the stairs and they laughed and left us and i had that doll when i left the ghetto and plus my mother had gone it's in a book that was written about the radomsko ghetto in a diary that was found after the war by a woman who had written a diary but she had not survived in page 122 of that book it says that my child would not be alive today this woman wrote if it weren't for my friend dunka fishman who was my mother because evidently my mother went to people in the ghetto and said what are you waiting for get your children out of here they want to kill all of us and people in the ghetto said to her oh how can you talk like that not a cultured country like germany the country of goethe and mozart uh, they're not going to kill women and children it's the men we, have, men we have to worry about but my mother did not believe them and she kept insisting that children should be saved and this is what happened she took only her own resources because the rest of the family the other children that were in the ghetto with us you know there were several other children my cousins who were in the ghetto with us their parents didn't think they should be smuggled out only that one cousin of mine bronca who was 12 years older she was considered old enough to make her own decision and she said yes she wanted to get out so she did get out on her own in a different way but my mother took only as i said the resources that my father and she had and i do remember that in the ghetto the rest of the family they made holes in the frame of the window and very gold in there and monies and all that could they thought would be saved and would be there when they could get access to it again anyway so my mother had me smuggled out of the ghetto and i do remember this woman coming to the ghetto and taking me out with bags of stuff my clothing and such and of course i didn't know who this woman might have been and by the way my mother had seen to it that i learned polish prayers we, we came from a polish speaking home my family did not speak yiddish at home so that made it somewhat easier in fact a lot easier but as also as i had been taught the prayers and she took me and out we went and i remember the first night we spent um in her apartment i guess it would have been in warsaw and i'll tell you you're adults i'm assuming no children are on so i'll tell you i had a, a memory also the first night she put me in a rocking chair in her room and on the other side of the room she was shall we say she was entertaining a male guest of course i had no idea what this was all about i didn't know until after the war until i grew up what this might have been all about but that was the first night and then she took me to the village where her mother was and um, um her mother was there and there was a little boy approximately my age also and this boy supposedly was this prostitute's child but the reason i should mention the reason why prostitutes were more likely to take children out of the ghetto because in those days there were no methods of birth control and so prostitutes had children so it was much more likely that a prostitute would have a child and sometimes it might be a jewish child that she was passing off as her own so i do remember that so i was sent to this woman and obviously they had already been paid with all the money that my mother managed to get and all my belongings that i had I was to stay with that woman but one day there was a fire being lit in this village and i say village i mean very very primitive not village as i might say in the united states and the little boy who was there one day threw that doll into the fire so after that i never again had another toy because i never again had another doll and also there was another incident a man was cutting down a tree in this little village and of course he was someone who had been born and raised in this village and when a branch of that tree fell on his foot he said oy vey and uh people laughed 
because they knew who he was. They knew his parents, they knew his grandparents, you know, he'd been there all his life. But evidently in that, I don't remember myself. Evidently it's true that I said that, or maybe the woman wanted to just get rid of me. And she said that when that tree fell on his foot and he said, oy vey, evidently I said, oh, when my grandmother fell down the stairs, she also said, oy vey. And in those days, that woman claimed that that was enough to give me away and she wanted to get rid of me. So that's what happened. And again, I don't know how she got in touch with her daughter, the prostitute, but she came to pick me up. And she took me to Warsaw by train. And there we met this woman who I didn't know sh who she was. And the woman took me by my hand and started talking to me, telling me that she was my mother. And I didn't quite believe her because it didn't look like my mother. She looked very, very different. But as she was holding me by the hand and we walked the streets in Warsaw and she was telling me all the different things from the apartment in the ghetto, who had lived in which room and what had happened in the ghetto and, you know, everything about the family members who had been there. I began to believe that she was telling me and that she was in fact my mother. And what my mother was doing was trying to find a hiding place for us because there was a curfew. And after the curfew in Warsaw, if you were on the street, it didn't matter who you were, you were shot. So she tried to get us to some safety. And I remember we were going from place to place trying to find a hiding place. And eventually a mother found, we walked into an apartment building, walked up through different stairs and found that above the last floor on the top, there was a place where we could lie down on the ground. And we did. And then in the morning again, we walked out and somehow I can only guess that my mother remembered that my father had a relative who was married to a non-Jew in Warsaw, in the suburb of Warsaw, a lovely suburb of Warsaw called Zolibush, Zolibush. It's a lovely, lovely suburb today. And we went there and my mother went to visit a woman and we stood in front of this woman. And again, I remember very clearly standing in front of this woman. Um, this woman came to the door when my mother knocked and my mother was telling her who we were. And this woman let us in and she offered to share her ration cards with us. Because you know, you had to have a ration cards to get any even minimal amount of food. I have to tell you the reason why my mother survived, and I didn't know this until my much, much later after the war, the reason why my mother had survived the deportation from Radomsko ghetto. And that's a story that I learned much later. And more recently, when on a visit more recently to Poland, I've been several times, but this is on a more recent visit, a woman who's a survivor of people from the Radomsko ghetto founded a small museum there. And when I went into the museum, they immediately said to me, what was your maiden name? And I said, Fishman. And immediately the woman said, oh, Rosalia, that was the name of our glass factory. And she said, just a minute, please wait here. I'll call the director of the museum. And he came and he led me into a room and he showed me pictures on the wall. There was a long picture on the wall and it showed people being marched and i understood from what he said to me these people this was the picture of people being marched by the germans this picture was taken by the germans you know they documented everything very thoroughly and this picture was of people being marched to be taken to treblinka to the death camp and i knew immediately that my family was among those people and then he took me to a cabinet that they had, like a China cabinet. And again, he was sitting there and he was pointing. And I looked, wondering what he was pointing at. And there were some glass pieces there that said that they were from the factory Rosalia. I was so moved by it that I never even thought to ask for a shard of glass from that place I wish I had. But anyway, so th this is how it was, you know. So anyway, to tell you, so my mother, this woman, Pani Kalushinska, was the name of this woman in Jolibush who took us in. And again, my, and I found out that my mother had survived 
the deportations from Radomska to the Treblinka gas chambers because she had a bleeding ulcer. And at that time, there were no medications. People didn't know what to do. So when the Germans came to deport people to Treblinka, my mother uh, started a hemorrhage and she went into a coma and she was left for dead. And the Jews who were called the legal Jews, these were shoemakers and tailors whom the Germans employed working for the German armies, they found my mother and helped my mother to smuggle herself out of the Warsaw Ghetto. And since my mother knew how to contact this prostitute, that's how she came to be reconnected with me. So there I was with my mother, but in those days to be in one hiding place didn't mean that you were safe. So this woman, Mrs. Kalushinska, Adela Kalushinska, her daughter, it turns out, worked with an 18-year-old and she worked for the Polish underground. And she was one day caught on the street with documents showing that she worked for the Polish resistance. And so it wasn't safe to be there because the Germans were going house to house to see who else might have been working for the Polish resistance. So we had to leave. So I have to make it brief, I guess. We don't have that much time. But from that point on, I was never again with my mother. I was in different hiding places. And as you might have guessed by my telling you that my mother came to people to tell them to get people out of the Warsaw, out of the Radomsko ghetto, my mother was very resourceful. So she was able to find different hiding places for me. And I'll just give you a brief glance at some of the hiding places that I was in. So. And I must say that only one other time was I ever with another child in a hiding place. A little boy approximately my age, Rishik was his name, but he was dressed in a girl's clothing, my clothing, and he was taught to speak Polish as a girl would because if he were found to be a boy, they would be looking to see if he was circumcised. Um, I don't know if you knew, on the trams that ran through Warsaw, they would sometimes stop the tram and have the men line up against the wall and drop their pants. And if they saw that men were circumcised, they would either kill them on the, speed, on the spot or they would send them to concentration camps. So this was the story with little Rishek, my friend, my one and only friend. Unfortunately, um, towards the end, I was once again with Rishek, as we were what, marched out of the Warsaw Ghetto, that was the very end of the war. My mother, I was reunited with my mother towards the end, and he was marching with his mother, dressed as a girl, with his mother, but his mother looked very Jewish. They were marching in front of me and my mother, and suddenly shots rang out, and he was killed in front of me. And I threw myself on top of him, but my mother pulled me away, you know, to acknowledge that I knew him was to acknowledge that I must be a Jew. Anyway, so that was the one hiding place. As I told you, this young woman was found to have those documents showing that she was working for the Polish underground. So when they caught her, every day they broadcast on the radios the tortures that they were inflicting on her because they thought that if they told people what they were doing to her, some people who had worked with her would come forward. So they talked, I remember clearly how they said that they were tearing out her nails, pulling off her nails, so that she would begin speaking. As far as I know, she, she never did begin to speak. But again, I had to get out of that house because I had to be in a different place. So I was in a good number of places, seven, because once when I was speaking to a school, and as I mentioned, I began speaking in the 70s, children often ask me how many different hiding places were you in? So one time I actually sat down and started writing the different, uh, about the different hiding places. It was seven, each one under very, very different circumstances. And, um, but when I speak to young people particularly, I do want to emphasize, and again, this is ultra important, especially at this time, that there were people who did the right thing, people who, at great risk to themselves and their own families, helped Jews. And I would not be alive today if it weren't for several such instances. This woman, Adela Kalushinska, was one, for example. 
and there were several others who did the same, even including some Germans. One of the other hiding places that I was in, as I said, there were seven altogether. One of them was a return to this place um, where I had been once before with this little boy where I had been hiding with him under the table, etc. before we were marched out of Warsaw. And uh, it's, you know, again, it's just very important. We were in hiding in this house, this little boy and I, with a number of Jews. This woman was supposedly, I learned after the war that she was probably born Jewish, but she was living as a Christian and she was in this lovely villa and she was hiding Jews, us among them, since this was one time when I didn't have papers. And one instance was that people who, Polish people, not Germans, broke into the house because they thought, oh, she's hiding Jews, there must be money, etc. So they broke into the house and they took what they could and they rounded us up under the dining room table. The little boy and I were under the dining room table and a man was crying, he was whimpering. So they shot him and the dog was barking, they killed the dog, that kind of situation. But having been in all these other hiding places, we came back to that place to hide again towards the end. And in that house, there were two hiding places. Actually in the basement of that house, there was a toilet and the adults had taken off the toilet tank and all the adults and we two children carried buckets of soil out and making like a tunnel to the next villa in case we had to be into hiding in that tunnel or in case we had to make our way to the next villa. So there was to be one hiding place. And upstairs in the attic, above the attic, there was a closet and there was a shelf in there, several shelves. One shelf, if you remove the shelf, there was a key. And if you opened up this closure, you know, with the key, you could crawl into the eaves of that attic. Very small space, as you can imagine, a flat space. Anyway, one day um, we were in that house and suddenly the Gestapo was in the house. We could hear the Gestapo in the bottom of the house and there was no way to get to the lower hiding place. So everybody went into the upper hiding place and the adults were all lying on the ground and this little boy and I were on top of them. And it was very quiet. And we could hear two pair of boots coming up the stairs. And suddenly, I do not ever and probably never will understand what happened, but suddenly, after some time of very quiet time, suddenly the adults began being very loud and they said, it's all over now. They'll either kill us now or they'll send us to the concentration camps. And the little boy and I crawled from one person to the other. We put our hands over their mouths and we said, please be quiet. You always told us to be quiet. We want to live. Please be quiet. And it became quiet again. We were very quiet. And after a while, we heard two pair of boots going down the stairs. And eventually the woman who owned the villa came and opened up the attic, you know, door at the gateway. And we came out and all the adults stood in front of her. And she said, you were very loud, but they chose not to hear you. And again, how to understand that the two German soldiers, if one of them had chosen to hear us, all of us would have been dead. And also one of the other, the other German would have been dead but they chose not to hear us. And another time, you know, when we were, after we were marched out of the Warsaw Ghetto, and again, this is, um, you may know about the Warsaw Uprising, not the Ghetto Uprising, but the Warsaw Uprising was when the Polish people rose up against Germany. They didn't have much, whatever tools they had, they didn't have weaponry. But when they marched us out, we were sent there are many other stories I could be telling, but I think we're running out of time, right? Um, I don't know how much time we have left. But anyway, um, we were, you know, marched out of 
Warsaw. I think it was about three days of marching that we did without any food, anything to drink. And we were finally put on trains. And I remember going with my mother on the train and people were saying that at the end, as you approach the train, they, they ask people if they have children, they ask the children, what would you like to eat when you get on the train? You have a choice of a, an apple or a piece of bread with a sugar cube. And I remember having this long discussion with my mother about which should I choose. But strangely enough, I don't remember what I chose. Anyway, they put us on the trains and again, we were squished in, you know, just squished in one next to the other. And of course we were as non-Jews. And some of the other people had some money on them evidently because as the train rolled along and sometimes it stopped in a village, people would come and hand up people pieces of bread or whatever. And anybody who had some money could get a piece of bread. But my mother didn't have any money. And I know after the war, my mother always said that I survived because I was a very obedient child. Whenever you told me not to do, I didn't do. Whatever you told me to do, I did do. So, you know, I changed my names many times, as my mother said, you know. And uh, my mother would just tell me, your name is now this. And I would, from that point on, say, that's my name. I remember one time my mother taking me by the shoulders and pinning me against the wall and saying, your name is now Teresa. I was Teresa. The next hiding place I was in, a woman was hiding me. This is my last hiding place before I was marched out of Warsaw. This woman, whom we call Chocha Lucia, Aunt Lucy, it would be in English, she was hiding me under the dining room table. In those days, the table cloth reached down to the floor, you know, the dining room tablecloth. And I had a potty under there, but I was afraid to use it. I was afraid to make any noise. I had no food under there. The whole nourishment was when I could get it. In the morning, people who lived in that apartment, and I'll tell you about them, would, we would line up and get a tablespoon of cod liver oil. It's not something to strive for, I can tell you not super delicious and also we had like black oil that we could have bread dipped in oil and why was i under the dining room table because this woman's brother worked for the gestapo as a jew finder and he lived in the same room where i was under the dining room table i can't show you as i do when i speak to schools he showed me of a distance of i don't know maybe two and a half feet, that's where he was sleeping. And I was in that room under the dining room table. As I told you, I was there with a party, but I was afraid to use it. I had no dolls. Remember my doll had been burned. I had no toys at all. And what did I do? I used to, I remember, pull out one hair at a time and I used to put it on the floor in the shape of a heart or a flower. And that was my whole entertainment. Now, during the day, when the man wasn't there, I could get out from under the table, but I couldn't approach the window because somebody might look up and see me and I didn't officially exist. Now, this woman had um, a young daughter who played the balalaika and she was in another room and she would play the balalaika and I loved hearing that. That was the whole my whole life under that table and it was under this table where I was that at the end of the Warsaw uprising and I understand I was two days after the Warsaw uprising my mother came to get me and she always said afterwards that she came to get me because she just knew that if she didn't get me she would never see me again and I guess she thought that she would be able to walk, march me out of there, march me out of that street. That street was across from what had been the Warsaw Ghetto. I could see the walls of the ghetto, you know, where everything had been already ruined in the ghetto. I could see the barbed wire fence on top. She thought, as I said, that she could march me out of there, but I couldn't walk. 
So she took me out. And again, as I said, I couldn't walk. So my mother called what my adult mind called a rickshaw. But my adult mind also said, rickshaw in Poland? That can't be. That's only in China. And you know, during our first workshops that we had as child survivors, this is what we did. We had a workshop called Validating Our Memories because we children didn't always trust our memories. As I said, my adult mind thought, oh, I'm remembering it wrong. I'm giving it a name that's not appropriate for it. But that's what it was. It was a rickshaw. And in the 70s, when I went on a trip to Poland with my late husband, and we went to Auschwitz back then in the museum, they had books. And the first book I opened up, I opened up, and guess what I saw? A rickshaw, what I call the rickshaw, in the Warsaw Ghetto. So that's what it was. And on the streets of Warsaw, actually. So this is one of the significant things that for us was the importance of having our conferences where we survivors could communicate with each other, where I always say, we don't need any introductions. It's like instant rapport, you know? We know where we're coming from. We speak the same languages. I'm, I don't mean we literally speak the same languages, but it's the same meaning, the same significance to what we say. We can trust that. So anyway, I did want to leave time. So I will tell you, um, as I said, I was in seven different hiding places and I went over with you what the last hiding place was. And there were, again, a few more in between. But um, when we were marched out of there and they put us in these villages, as I told you, we were put in on trains and taken to villages, very primitive in Poland. And after three days of riding on trains or such, we were put in villages and we were assigned a home in a very primitive house on a place, you know, in there. And I was there with my mother, but my mother had another bleed, severe bleed. And she was again, I guess, in a coma and they called um, the priest, the priest came and gave my mother the last rites of the Catholic Church and she was put into a wagon. I remember when the priest came, she was put into a wagon and she was taken to a hospital in Krakow and I was left there alone with the peasants. And, you know, I was still only not quite seven, I guess. And I had to help because I had a baby. I had to change diapers and that kind of thing. But there were also some German soldiers in that place in the same, sharing the same room as where I was. And uh, German soldiers who were quarantined there, who were living there, and they had food. So again, one of these German soldiers shared his rations with me, shared his food with me. He would put me on his left knee, and I remember he had something that looked like, like a gel, you know, round, and he would put me on his knee and he would give me slices of that. And then at night he would cover me with one of his own blankets. And I later found out when after my mother had come back from the hospital and she, I don't know how she did it because to acknowledge that you spoke German or something was to acknowledge that maybe you, you weren't who you said you were, you know? And the, these Polish people who lived in these peasant villages, they didn't just hate Jews. They also hated people who lived in the cities because they thought the people in the cities had taken advantage of them, you know, buying their produce for not as much as it was worth, etc. cetera. Uh, but somehow my mother was able to, I don't know how, somehow she had communicated with this German. And it turns out he was actually from Vienna, from Austria. And I should tell you, so what happened was we were finally in this village after my mother had come back, we were liberated by Russian soldiers. Oh, before that, I should tell you, one of the girls from that little village took me to visit my mother in Krakow. We walked for several days. We walked and we stayed at different farmhouses on the way to Krakow and to visit my mother. And when we finally came back, uh, we were liberated by the Russians. And again, my mother was able to hitch a ride for us both 
uh, with the Russians and we went back. I think it was Lodge where we first went back because in those days when Jews were coming back after the war, wherever there had been a building that had been of significance to Jews, whether it was a school or a synagogue or whatever, people, the Jews returning, Jews would post their names on sheets of paper. And that's why, um, where my mother saw the names of one of my father's brothers. My mother and father were each of five, one of five siblings. Only one of my father's brothers survived, this one that I'm mentioning now. He had survived three concentration camps and his name was posted. And my one cousin, the one I told you about, who was 12 years older than I, her name was posted. She had survived under really difficult circumstances too. She had survived as a maid for a family in Krakow. And she used to tell me, I talked her into doing a Shawa interview after, you know, when the Shoah interviews began, I, I was doing them in Philadelphia and I was interviewed, I talked her into doing it. And on the Shoah interviews, she said that she would not have come back to being Jewish if my name and my mother's name had not been posted there. She would have stayed with the man with whom she had had the baby after, you know, after the war. But unfortunately that baby, a boy, had died of pneumonia before we could escape from Poland. Anyway, so um, this is, you know, where we were. And I think you want to say something, Sandy? Are we? Well, I just, since it's uh, 620, I thought maybe you might like to touch a little bit on the claims conference uh, and, and this campaign. Oh, Thanks, okay. Stephanie. Okay. So, I could hear you talk forever, but... <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yes, this is very important to do. And the claims conference kind of had me get started, but now you may know that there are many, many, many survivors all over who are on Facebook and other sites, you know, asking that people join in speaking and, you know, asking uh, Zuckerberg not to, po not to allow any postings that are, anti-Semitic or anything of that nature, any denial on Facebook, any denial of the Holocaust, because unfortunately it is happening. And I don't need to tell you how many incidents there have been in the United States and all other countries. And the other thing I think that you should know is that there are other countries that don't allow that kind of posting on Facebook and that being Germany and Austria and I think it's Belgium that also doesn't allow it. So if they can do it, why can't we here in this country? And so please do see to it. And also any other incidents that you see, any incidents, this is the other thing that I want to say to youngsters when I speak. And I've been saying that again since the 70s, long before this came up. I've been saying that any act of discrimination, you should, when you see that, you should speak up, no matter whether it's anti-Semitic or discrimination against any other minority groups, because it can lead to more. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You're muted. You sorry. Oh. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask you, when you want people to um, participate in this campaign, are you suggesting that we write Mark Zuckerberg? We, I know I'm continuing to post things I receive from the claims conference. How can people obtain those, um, you know, like the testimony you had for the claims conference that was on Facebook, how can people get to those? Is there a site? Well, I'm sure if you just get to the, the, the claims conference, yes. So if you Google Claims Conference, everybody, you should be able to go there and post these yourself on Facebook. Yeah, it's through the Claims Conference that we've done that. Can you explain to people what briefly what the Claims Conference is, please? Yes, it's called Jewish Material Claims Against Germany. And it began many years ago. And it's to, the name tells you a lot, it's and again, when there's Holocaust denial, and again, I've heard people say, oh, it didn't happen, et cetera, et cetera. 
the fact is that it did happen. And I, uh, once I was asked, you know, how can you, what are some of the reasons that you can say that? And I say, Germany is paying restitution. What does restitution mean? It means to give back, right? Restore. Would they be doing that if they weren't responsible, if they weren't guilty? And that's been done for a long, long time. And it's going on still. And what is this? Initially, um, it was, you know, wasn't money that was coming to, from as many sources, nor going to as many sources mm -hmm. as it now does. But that's what's being done. And uh, as I said, there are other things. There's the World Jewish Restitution Organization also, and that's property restitution. And again, these are properties that were taken by not just Germany, but other countries. And believe it or not, most other countries, Germany has done a great deal of property restitution, mm -hmm. as has Austria and as have some other countries. Unfortunately, Poland, the country I come from, has been the least inclined to do so. And most recently, actually Romania, that was also holding back, Romania is now doing property restitution. All this is through the variant efforts of the claims conference. So um, I just wonder, does anybody have any questions, any other questions that they would like to post in the Q&A? Well, I'll ask another while we're waiting to see if anybody types anything in. Um, so you were a teenager when you got to the United States? 13. 13. Did you, were you able to go to school then? Well, I first went to school in Vienna. Uh, my mother and I left Poland uh, when I was eight, October 1946. <laughs> And we had had to wait at the border in Poland for six weeks because the Russians were already in Poland and we couldn't leave legally. And something interesting happened when we were getting on the trains. Uh, we were told when you get on the trains and the Russians come aboard, uh, make believe you don't understand Polish and you don't understand Russian. And you know, all these years, I never knew why, why? It wasn't until the US Holocaust Memorial Museum I don't remember exactly the year, but it was around way before the year 2000, I think, when they held the conference for people who had been in DP camp. It was called the DP camp conference. And I went to the conference and they had a session on why we had been told not to acknowledge that we spoke Polish or Russian. And that's because we were leaving Poland as Turks because after the war, hundreds of people from different countries were trying to relocate to their home countries. So we were leaving officially as Turks, going back to Turkey. Of course, we weren't Turkish, but we were to make believe we were so that we wouldn't be taken back to Poland, you know? So anyway, so my mother and I made it to Vienna, Austria. We lived in DP camps until the DP camps closed, but we couldn't leave for anywhere. Um, we wanted to go, I wanted to go to Palestine, what was then Palestine, because I had read the book by Herzl, the name German, and I wanted to leave. I actually left home. My mother had remarried. It wasn't very good. And I ran away to get on the train that I knew was taking orphan children, Jewish children. So it was then Palestine. My mother figured out where I had gone. So she got me off the train. But, um, excuse me. <coughs> So then uh, my mother had this severe heart condition, so she was considered not healthy enough to get on the boats that were going to Palestine or couldn't get, you know, on any transportation to go to Australia. That was the other option. And the United States first wasn't letting Jews in, people in. And then I came down with TB. I was diagnosed with TB, so I couldn't go. So I had to undergo the TV cure, we didn't have money to send me to a sanatorium. So there again, I was like 10 years old and my mother sent me by myself into the mountains each summer until my TB was arrested. And then finally, I came through the efforts of Hayas, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, that was bringing people to the United States. I came on the US 
army ship, the General Muir. I came in February of 1952 to New York and I skipped a few more grades and I learned English. Um, I learned English while I was doing embroidery work. They didn't have classes for beginner English or something like that. So I just did embroidery while I was learning English. I still have the pillows. <laughs> and um, then I you know, graduated high school before I was 17 and went on to City College of New York. Went on to get my college degree and then a master's degree in psychology and counseling. Thank you. We have one question uh, actually from uh, Dallas from my um, cousin who's joining us. He would like to know if you know Fritzi Fritzhall, Fritz Hall, who also survived the Holocaust, in particular Mengele. Uh, she's from Skokie and was one of the founders of the museum in Skokie. And I know we've had a conference there I attended. Yes, we did. Do you happen to know her? I know the name, but I'm not picturing her right now. Yes, okay. I do. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, someone else has asked, is there an organized petition or effort that people can join in order to pressure Facebook and Zuckerberg? Um, well, as I said, it's the one that started by the claims conference. I should have gotten that information before. I'm sorry. Well, one of, one of the things I, I interrupt for a second, since we have everyone's emails, one of the things I believe we could do is send some of that information to everybody following the end of this because we said we would end at 6 30 um and it's 6 34 so maybe we could just give it a couple more minutes does anybody okay. else i can send you the i don't have it in front of me but i have the information okay. two women who work at the claims conference who are handling this okay i'm sorry i didn't know that would be coming up no that's very good we can we can send that out yes i can tell them and then they can provide you with the information. Okay, very good. Yeah, I, it's a very, very important effort, I think, you know, to do that. Does anybody else have any um, questions? It puts us to shame. What Mark Zuckerberg is doing is putting us to shame as a country who's not acknowledging, you know, that this is not something one should do. There's another question here. Has Facebook acknowledged the activism of Holocaust survivors? And if so, what has been their response? No, not as far as I know. No response? Not as far as I know. Again, I'm not directly involved. I did this through the claims conference, but they're the ones, you know, as far as I know, I'm sure we would have been notified had that happened. I'm sure not. Well, I want you to know, Stephanie, that a couple of people, as another friend of ours has said, thank you for your courage and tenacity. So thank I think you have many admirers among this group, including me. Um, I, I wanted to say you, that- Andy, for doing what you do. Well, for many, many years, child survivors were not considered survivors. They were rather ignored. What did you know? You were too young. And I think it took tremendous courage for you to start this not knowing that it would lead to you know a worldwide organization right as you know in 1985 when the american gathering held a meeting in philadelphia and i went there was a room full of about 60 people approximately my you know younger people shall we say and uh, and I thought I was the only one when I, the Philadelphia area had an older survivors group. These were usually concentration camp survivors. And whenever I would approach them, they would look me up and down and they said, but you were only a child. What could you possibly remember? And I thought I was the only one who was experiencing it. And when I went to that meeting and, you know, Dr. Judith Kestenberg was the one who called this meeting and she spoke and afterwards someone you may know, I don't know if I should say her name, from LA where the group had been started by someone else before Dr. Sarah Moskowitz. She came to the head of the table and she said, they tell us that we cannot possibly remember because we were only children. But I remember how they took their children, the children by their legs and swung their heads against the wall. And at that point, the room just went dead still. 
and it was the last meeting of this conference in August. It was very hot in Philadelphia. They turned off the air conditioning. They flickered the lights. Nobody mm -hmm. moved. And finally, I said, we have to get together again. And Dr. Kestenberg said, you can't get together by yourselves. You've been through too much trauma. You have to have a psychiatrist or psychologist meet with you. And I said, but we're here now. And I literally took two pieces of paper out. And I said, who wants to come and give me their names? People came forward. And Dr. Kestenberg saw what the response was. And so she relented and she gave me the names of groups that were starting in cities where she had already spoken. And one city was New York, Boston, Baltimore, Washington. And I held a picnic where I lived in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, and 35 people came. Eva Fogelman was one of the people that came and other people came. And unfortunately, Michael Gleiberman, who owned the hotel where we met, just passed away, away mm. two weeks ago. And we, I, there were no computers then, there were no cell phones. So strictly by word of mouth, I got in touch with people and word spread. And there were 18 of us to met who met in Lancaster in preparation for this meeting. We call, it, we're called the Lancaster 18. The time that we met, we never slept the whole night. I remember I shared a room with two other child survivors, one from Hungary and one somewhere else. We never closed our eyes the whole night. We talked about our experiences. And at the very first meeting, 174 people came. And we have never been under 300 ever since then. We were as many as 900 in Israel in 91. That's amazing. Well, I'm afraid we have to close the program now. I want to thank everybody for attending. Tamara? Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. You sharing your story with us was so moving and interesting. Um, and we do need to be considerate of everybody's time now. So I'll close this out. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this webcast. And we will send you the information that we will get from uh, Stephanie uh, shortly. And good yeah. night, everyone.